Chapter 14 of How It Flies, or Conquest of the Air. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. How It Flies, or Conquest of the Air, by Richard Ferris. Chapter 14. Balloons. The Dirigible. The dirigible balloon, or airship, is built on the same general principles as the ordinary balloon, that is, with the envelope to contain the lifting gas, a car to carry the load, and the suspending cordage, but to this is added some form of propelling power to enable it to make headway against the wind, and a rudder for steering it. Almost from the very beginning of ballooning, some method of directing the balloon to a predetermined goal had been sought by inventors. Drifting at the fickle pleasure of the prevailing wind did not accord with man's desire for authority and control. The first step in this direction was the change from the spherical form of the gas bag to an elongated shape, the round form having an inclination to turn round and round in the air while floating, and having no bow and stern structure upon which steering devices could operate. The first known proposal in this direction was made by Brisson, a French scientist, who suggested building the gas bag in the shape of a horizontal cylinder with conical ends, its length to be five or six times its diameter. His idea for its propulsion was the employment of large bladed oars, but he rightly doubted whether human strength would prove sufficient to work these rapidly enough to give independent motion to the airship. About the same time, another French inventor had actually built a balloon with a gas bag shaped like an egg, and placed horizontally with the blunt end foremost. The reduction in the resistance of the air to this form was so marked that the elongated gas bag quickly displaced the former spherical shape. This balloon was held back from traveling at the full speed of the wind by the clever device of a rope dragging on the ground, and by a sail rigged so as to act on the wind which blew past the retarded balloon, the navigator was able to steer it within certain limits. It was the first dirigible balloon. In the same year, the brothers Robert, of Paris, built an airship for the Duke of Chartres under the direction of General Mesnier, a French officer of engineers. It was cylindrical, with hemispherical ends, 52 feet long and 32 feet in diameter, and contained 30,000 cubic feet of gas. The gas bag was made double to prevent the escape of the hydrogen, which had proved very troublesome in previous balloons, and it was provided with a spherical air balloon inside of the gas bag, which device was expected to preserve the form of the balloon unchanged by expanding or contracting, according to the rising or falling of the airship. When the ascension was made on July 6, 1784, the air balloon stuck fast in the neck of the gas bag, and so prevented the escape of gas as the hydrogen expanded in the increasing altitude. The gas bag would have burst had not the Duke drawn his sword and slashed a vent for the imprisoned gas. The airship came safely to earth. It was General Musnier who first suggested the interior ballonnet of air to preserve the tense outline of the form of the airship, and the elliptical form for the gas bag was another of his inventions. In the building of the airship of the Duc de Chartres, he made the further suggestion that the space between the two envelopes be filled with air, and so connected with the air pumps that it could be inflated or deflated at will. For the motive power, he designed three screw propellers of one blade each, to be turned unceasingly by a crew of eighty men. Musnier was killed in battle in 1793, and aeronautics lost its most able developer at that era. In 1789, Baron Scott, an officer in the French army, devised a fish-shaped airship with two outside balloon-shaped pockets, which could be forcibly drawn into the body of the airship to increase its density, and thus cause its descent. It began to be realized that no adequate power existed by which balloons could be propelled against even light winds to such a degree that they were really con controllable. And balloon ascensions came to be merely an adjunct of the exhibit of the traveling showman. For this reason, the earlier part of the 19th century seems barren of aeronautical incident as compared with the latter part of the preceding century. In 1848, Hugh Bell, an Englishman, built a cylindrical airship with convex pointed ends. It was 55 feet long and 21 feet in diameter. It had a keel-shaped framework of tubes to which the long, narrow car was attached, and there was a screw propeller on each side to be worked by hand and a rudder to steer with. It failed to work. In 1852, however, a new era opened for the airship. Henry Giffard of Paris, the inventor of the world-famed injector for steam boilers, built an elliptical gas bag with cigar-shaped ends, 144 feet long and 40 feet in diameter, 
having a cubic content of 88,000 cubic feet. The car was suspended from a rod 66 feet long, which hung from the net covering the gas bag. It was equipped with a three-horsepower steam engine, which turned a two-bladed screw propeller 11 feet in diameter at the rate of 110 revolutions per minute. Coke was used for fuel. The steering was done with a triangular rudder sail. Upon trial on September 24, 1852, the airship proved a success, traveling at the rate of nearly six miles per hour. Gifford built a second airship in 1855, of a much more elongated shape, 235 feet long and 33 feet in diameter. He used the same engine which propelled his first ship. After a successful trial trip, when about to land, the gas bag unaccountably turned up on end, allowing the net and car to slide off, and, rising slightly in the air, burst. Giffard and his companion escaped unhurt. Giffard afterward built the large captive balloon for the London Exhibition in 1868, and the still larger one for the Paris Exposition in 1878. He designed a large airship to be fitted with two boilers and a powerful steam engine, but became blind and died in 1882. In 1865, Paul Hanlein devised a cigar-shaped airship to be inflated with coal gas. It was to be propelled by a screw at the front to be driven by a gas engine drawing its fuel from the gas in the body of the ship. An interior airbag was to be expanded as the gas was consumed, to keep the shape intact. A second propeller revolving horizontally was intended to raise or lower the ship in the air. It was not until 1872 that he finally secured the building of an airship at Vienna after his plans. It was 164 feet long and 30 feet in diameter. The form of the gas bag was that described by the keel of a ship rotated around the center line of its deck as an axis. The engine was of the Lenoir type, with four horizontal cylinders, developing about six horsepower, and turned a propeller about 15 feet in diameter at the rate of 40 revolutions per minute. The low lifting power of the coal gas with which it was inflated caused it to float quite near the ground. With a consumption of 250 cubic feet of gas per hour, it traveled at a speed of 10 miles an hour. The lack of funds seems to have prevented further experiments with an invention which was at least very promising. In the same year, a dirigible balloon built by Dupont de Lhomme for use by the French government during the siege of Paris was given a trial. It was driven by a screw propeller turned by eight men, and although it was 118 feet long and 49 feet in diameter, it made as good a speed record as Giffard's steam-driven airship, six miles an hour. In 1881, the brothers Albert and Gaston Tissandier exhibited at the Electrical Exhibition in Paris a model of an electrically driven airship, originally designed to establish communication with Paris during the siege of the Franco-Prussian War. In 1883, the airship built after this model was tried. It was 92 feet long and 30 feet at its largest diameter. The motive power was a Siemens motor run by 24 bichromate cells of 17 pounds each. At full speed, the motor made 180 revolutions per minute, developing 1.5 horsepower. The pull was 26 pounds. The propeller was 9 feet in diameter, and a speed of a little more than 6 miles an hour was attained. In 1884, two French army engineers, Renaud and Krebs, built an airship, the now historic La France, with the shape of a submarine torpedo. It was 165 feet long and about 27 feet in diameter at the largest part. It had a gas content of 66,000 cubic feet. A 9-horsepower Gram electric motor was installed, driven by a storage battery. This operated the screw propeller 20 feet in diameter, which was placed at the forward end of the long car. The trial was made on the 9th of August and was a complete success. The ship was sailed with the wind for about 2.5 miles, and then turned about and made its way back against the wind till it stood directly over its starting point, and was drawn down to the ground by its anchor ropes. The trip of about five miles was made in twenty-three minutes. In seven voyages undertaken, the airship was steered back safely to its starting point five times. This first airship which really deserved the name marked an era in the development of this type of aircraft. In view of its complete success, it is astonishing that nothing further was done in this line in France for fifteen years, when Santos Dumont began his series of record-making flights. Within this period, however, the gasoline motor had been adapted to the needs of the automobile, and thus a new and lightweight engine, suitable in every respect, had been placed within the reach of aeronauts. In the meantime, a new idea had been brought to the stage of actual trial. 
In 1893, in St. Petersburg, David Schwartz built a rigid airship, the gas receptacle of which was sheet aluminum. It was braced by aluminum tubes, but while being inflated, the interior work was so badly broken that it was abandoned. Schwartz made a second attempt in Berlin in 1897. The airship was safely inflated, and managed to hold its position against a wind blowing 17 miles an hour, but could not make headway against it. After the gas had been withdrawn, and before it could be put under shelter, a severe windstorm damaged it, and the mob of spectators speedily demolished it in the craze for souvenirs of the occasion. In 1898, the young Brazilian, Santos Dumont, came to Paris imbued with aeronautic zeal, and determined to build a dirigible balloon that would surpass the former achievements of Giffard and Renard, which he felt confident were but hints of what might be accomplished by that type of airship. He began the construction of the series of dirigible balloons which eventually numbered twelve, each successive one being an improvement on the preceding. He made use of the airbag suggested by Mesnier for the balloon of the Duke of Chartres in 1784, although in an original way, at first using a pneumatic pump to inflate it, and later a rotatory fan. Neither prevented the gas bag from buckling and coming down with consequences more or less serious to the airship, but Santos Dumont himself always escaped injury. His own record of his voyages in his book My Airships gives a more detailed account of his contrivances and inventions than can be permitted here. If Santos Dumont did not greatly surpass his predecessors, he is at least to be credited with an enthusiasm which aroused the interest of the whole world in the problems of aeronautics and his later achievements in the building and flying of aeroplanes give him a unique place in the history of man's conquest of the air. In 1900, Count von Zeppelin's great airship, which had been building for nearly two years, was ready for trial. It had the form of a prism of 24 sides, with the ends arcing to a blunt point. It was 420 feet long, and 38 feet in diameter. The structure was rigid, of aluminum latticework, divided into 17 compartments, each of which had a separate gas bag shaped to fit its compartment. Overall was an outer envelope of linen and silk treated with pegamoid. A triangular keel of aluminum lattice strengthened the whole, and there were two cars of aluminum attached to the keel. Each car held a 16-horsepower Daimler gasoline motor, operating two four-bladed screw propellers which were rigidly connected with the frame of the ship a little below the level of its axis. A sliding weight was run to either end of the keel, as might be required, to depress the head or tail, in order to rise or fall in the air. The cars were in the shape of boats, and the ship was built in a floating shed on the Lake of Constance, near Friedrichshafen. At the trial, the airship was floated out on the lake, the car boats resting on the water. Several accidents happened, so that though the ship got up into the air it could not be managed, and was brought down to the water again without injury. In a second attempt, a speed of twenty miles an hour was attained. The construction was found to be not strong enough for the great length of the body, the envelope of the balloon was not sufficiently gas-tight, and the engines were not powerful enough. But few trips were made in it, and they were short. The Count set himself to work to raise money to build another ship, which he did five years later. In 1901, an inventor named Rosé built an airship in Colombo, having two gas envelopes with the engines and car placed between them. He expected to do away with the rolling and pitching of single airships by the double form, but the ship did not work satisfactorily, ascending to barely fifty feet. In 1902, Augusto Severo, a Brazilian, arranged an airship with the propelling screws at the axis of the gas bag, one at each end of the ship. Instead of a rudder, he provided two small propellers to work in a vertical plane and swing the ship sideways. Soon after ascending, it was noticed that the propellers were not working properly, and a few minutes later the car was seen to be in flames, and the balloon exploded. Severo and his companion Sache were killed, falling 1,300 feet. In the same year, Baron bratsky Lebeau built an airship with partitions in the gas bag, which was just large enough to counterbalance the weight of the ship and its operators. It was lifted or lowered by a propeller working horizontally. Another propeller drove the ship forward. Through some lack of stability the car turned over, throwing out the two aeronauts, who fell 300 feet and were instantly killed. In 1902, a dirigible balloon was built for the brothers Lebaudi by the engineer Julio and the aeronaut Sir Hof. The gas envelope was made cigar-shaped and fastened rigidly to a rigid elliptical keel-shaped floor 70 feet long and 19 feet wide made of steel tubes, the object being to prevent rolling and pitching. 
It was provided with both horizontal and vertical rudders. A 35-horsepower Daimler Mercedes motor was used to turn two twin-bladed screws, each of 9 feet in diameter. Between the 25th of October, 1902, and the 21st of November, 1903, 33 experimental voyages were made, the longest being 61 miles in 2 hours and 46 minutes, 38.7 miles in 1 hour and 41 minutes, 23 miles in 1 hour and 36 minutes. In 1904, this ship was rebuilt. It was lengthened to 190 feet, and the rear end rounded off. Its capacity was increased to 94,000 cubic feet, and a new covering of the yellow calico which had worked so well on the first model was used on the new one. It was coated with rubber both on the outside and inside. The interior airbag was increased in size to 17,650 cubic feet, and partitioned into three compartments. During 1904 and 1905, 30 voyages were made, carrying in all 195 passengers. The success of this airship led to a series of trials under the direction of the French Army, and in all of these trials it proved satisfactory. After the 76th successful voyage, it was retired for the winter of 1905-06. In November 1905, the rebuilt Zeppelin airship was put upon trial. While superior to the first one, it met with serious accident and was completely wrecked by a windstorm in January 1906. In May 1906, Major von Parseval's non-rigid airship passed through its first trials successfully. This airship may be packed into small compass for transportation and is especially adapted for military use. In plan, it is slightly different from previous types, having two airbags, one in each end of the envelope, and the front end is hemispherical instead of pointed. As the airship is designed to force its way through the air, instead of floating placidly in it, it is evident that it must have a certain tenseness of outline in order to retain its shape, and resist being doubled up by the resistance it encounters. It is estimated that the average velocity of the wind at the elevation at which the airship sails is 18 miles per hour. If the speed of the ship is to be 20 miles per hour, as related to stations on the ground, and if it is obliged to sail against the wind, it is plain that the wind pressure which it is compelled to meet is 38 miles per hour, a gale of no mean proportions. When the large expanse of the great gas bags is taken into consideration, it is evident that ordinary balloon construction is not sufficient. Attempts have been made to meet the outside pressure from the wind and air resistance by producing mechanically a counterpressure from the inside. Air bags are placed inside the cavity of the gas bag, usually one near each end of the airship, and these are inflated by pumping air into them under pressure. In this way, an outward pressure of as much as 7 pounds to the square foot may be produced, equivalent to the resistance of air at a speed, either of the wind or of the airship, or of both combined, of 48 miles per hour. It is evident, however, that the pressure upon the front end of an airship making headway against a strong wind will be much greater than the pressure at the rear end, or even than that amidships. It was this uneven pressure upon the outside of the gas bag that doubled up the first two airships of Santos Dumont and led him to increase the proportional girth at the amidship section in his later dirigibles. The great difficulty of adjusting these varying pressures warrants the adherence of Count von Zeppelin to his design with the rigid structure and metallic sheathing. The loss of the second Zeppelin airship so discouraged its designer that he decided to withdraw from further aeronautical work, but the German government prevailed on him to continue, and by October 1906 he had the Zeppelin III in the air. This airship was larger than Zeppelin II in both length and diameter, and held 135,000 cubic feet more of gas. The motive power was supplied by two gasoline motors, each of 85 horsepower. The gas envelope had 16 sides, instead of 24, as in the earlier ship. At its trial, the Zeppelin III proved highly successful. It made a trip of 69 miles, with 11 passengers, in two and a quarter hours, a speed of about 30 miles an hour. The German government now made an offer of $500,000 for an airship which would remain continuously in the air for 24 hours and be able to land safely. Count von Zeppelin immediately began work upon his number four in the effort to meet these requirements, in the meantime continuing trips with the number three. The most remarkable of these trips was made in September 1907, a journey of 211 miles in eight hours. In October 1907, the English airship Nully Secundus was given its first trial. The gas envelope had been made of gold beaters' skins, which are considered impermeable to the contained gas, but are very expensive. 
This airship was of the non-rigid type. It made the trip from Aldershot to London, a distance of 50 miles, in three and one-half hours, an apparent speed of 14 miles per hour, lacking information as to the aid or hindrance of the prevailing wind. Several other trials were made, but with small success. The offer of the German government had stimulated other German builders besides Count von Zeppelin, and on October 28, 1907, the Parsifal I, which had been improved, and the new Gross dirigible competed for the government prize at Berlin. The Parsifal kept afloat for six and one-half hours, and the Gross for eight and one-quarter hours. Meanwhile, in France, the Lebaudis had been building a new airship which was named La Patrie. It was 197 feet long and 34 feet in diameter. In a trial for altitude, it was driven to an elevation of 4,300 feet. On November 23, 1907, the Patrie set out from Paris for Verdun, a distance of 146 miles. The journey was made in six and three-quarters hours, at an average speed of 25 miles per hour, and the fuel carried was sufficient to have continued the journey 50 miles further. Soon after reaching Verdun, a severe gale tore the airship away from the regiment of soldiers detailed to assist the anchors in holding it down, and it disappeared into the clouds. It is known to have passed over England, for parts of its machinery were picked up at several points, and some days later the gas bag was seen floating in the North Sea. Following close upon the ill-fated Patrie came the Ville de Paris, a dirigible which had been built by Socrouf for M. Henri Deutsch de la Meurthe, an eminent patron of aeronautic experiments. In size, this airship was almost identical with the Lost Patrie, but it was quite different in appearance. It did not have the flat framework at the bottom of the gas envelope, but was entirely round in section, and the long car was suspended below. At the rear, the gas bag was contracted to a cylindrical form, and four groups of two ballonets each were attached to act as stabilizers. It was offered by M. de la Muerte to the French government to take the place of the Patrie in the army maneuvers at Verdun, and on January 15, 1908, made the trip thither from Paris in about seven hours. It was found that the ballonets exerted considerable drag upon the ship. In June 1908, the great Zeppelin IV was completed and given its preliminary trials, and on July 1st it started on its first long journey. Leaving Friedrichshafen, its route was along the northerly shore of Lake Constance, nearly to Schaffhausen, then southward to and around Lake Lucerne, thence northward to Zurich, thence eastward to Lake Constance, and to its shed at Friedrichshafen. The distance traversed was 236 miles, and the time consumed 12 hours. This voyage without a single mishap aroused the great enthusiasm among the German people. After several short flights, during which the King of Württemberg, the Queen, and some of the royal princes were passengers, the Zeppelin IV set out on August 4th to win the government reward by making the 24-hour flight. Sailing eastward from Friedrichshafen, it passed over Basle, then turning northward it followed the valley of the Rhine, passing over Strasbourg and Mannheim, and had nearly reached Mayence when a slight accident necessitated a landing. Repairs were made, and the journey resumed after nightfall. Mayence was reached at 11 p.m., and the return trip begun. When passing over Stuttgart, at 6 a.m., a leak was discovered, and a landing was made at Erchterdingen, a few miles farther on. Here, while repairs were being made, a squall struck the airship and bumped it heavily on the ground. Some gasoline was spilled, in some unknown way, which caught fire, and in a few moments the great balloon was totally destroyed. It had been in continuous flight eleven hours up to the time of the first landing, and altogether twenty and three-quarters hours, and had traveled two hundred and fifty-eight miles. The German people immediately started a public subscription to provide Count von Zeppelin with the funds needed to build another airship, and in a few days the sum of one million five hundred thousand was raised and turned over to the unfortunate inventor. The Zeppelin III was taken in hand, and lengthened, and more powerful engines installed. The Gross II was ready to make its attempt for the government prize on September 11, 1908. It sailed from Tegel to Magdeburg and back to Tegel, a distance of 176 miles, in 13 hours, without landing. Four days later, the Parsifal II made a trip between the same points in 11 and a half hours, but cut the distance traveled down to 157 miles. In October, the Parsifal II was sent up for an altitude test, and rose to a height of 5,000 feet above Tegel, hovering over the city for upward of an hour. During 1908, an airship designed by M. Clement, the noted motorcar builder, was being constructed in France. It made its first voyage on October 29th, 
carrying seven passengers from Sartreville to Paris and back, at a speed of from 25 to 30 miles per hour. The illustration gives a very good idea of the peculiar ballonnets attached to the rear end of the gas envelope. These ballonnets opened into the large gas bag and are practically a part of it. In Italy, a remarkable dirigible has been built by Captain Riccaldoni for military purposes. It has the form of a fish, blunt forward, and tapering straight away to the rear. It has a large fin-like surface on the underside of the gas bag toward the rear. Its performances show that its efficiency as compared with its motive power is larger than any other dirigible in commission. In May 1909, the rebuilt Zeppelin III, now rechristened Zeppelin II, after many successful short flights, was prepared for the government trial. On May 29, 1909, with a crew of six men, Count von Zeppelin started from Friedrichshafen for Berlin, 360 miles away. The great ship passed over Ulm, Nuremberg, Beruth, and Leipzig, and here it encountered so strong a headwind from the north that it was decided to turn about at Bitterfeld and return to Friedrichshafen. The distance traveled had been nearly 300 miles in 21 hours. The course followed was quite irregular, and took the ship over Würzburg and by a wide detour to Heilbronn and Stuttgart. The supply of gasoline running low, it was decided to land at Gopingen, where more could be obtained. It was raining heavily, and through some mistake in steering, or some sudden veering of the wind, the prow of the great dirigible came into collision with a tree upon the hillside. The envelope was badly torn, and a part of the aluminum inner structure wrecked. However, the mechanics on board were able to make such repairs that the ship was able to resume the voyage the next day, and made port without further mishap. The vessel having been thirty-eight hours in the air at the time of the accident, so much of the government's stipulations had been complied with but it had not succeeded in landing safely. Nevertheless, it was accepted by the government. The entire journey has been variously estimated at from 680 to 900 miles, either figure being a record for dirigibles. On August 4th, the dirigible Gross II made a voyage from Berlin to Apolda and returned, a distance of 290 miles in 16 hours. This airship also was accepted by the German government and added to its fleet. In August, the Zeppelin II was successfully sailed to Berlin, where Count von Zeppelin was welcomed by an immense and enthusiastic multitude of his countrymen, including the Emperor and the royal family. On September 26th, the new French dirigible, La République, built on the model of the successful Lebaudy airships, met with an accident while in the air. A blade of one of the propellers broke and slashed into the envelope. The ship fell from a height of 6,000 feet, and its crew of four men lost their lives. On April the 22nd, 1910, a fleet of German dirigibles, comprising the Zeppelin II, the Gross II, and the Parseval I, sailed from Cologne to Hamburg, where they were reviewed by Emperor William. A strong wind having arisen, the Gross II, which is of the semi-rigid type, was deflated and shipped back to Cologne by rail. The non-rigid Parseval made the return flight in safety. The rigid Zeppelin II started on the return voyage, but was compelled to descend at Limburg, where it was moored. The wind increasing, it was forced away, and finally was driven to the ground at Weilburg, and demolished. In May 1910, the Parseval V, the smallest dirigible so far constructed, being but 90 feet in length, was put upon its trial trip. It made a circular voyage of 80 miles in four hours. For several months, a great Zeppelin passenger dirigible had been building by a stock company financed by German capital under the direction of the dauntless Count von Zeppelin. It was 490 feet long, with a capacity of 666,900 cubic feet. A passenger cabin was built with one-quarter inch mahogany veneer upon a framework of aluminum, the inside being decorated with panels of rosewood inlaid with mother-of-pearl. The seats were wicker chairs, and the window openings had no glass. It was christened the Deutschland. After many days waiting for propitious weather, the first airliner set sail on June 22, 1910, from Friedrichshafen for Dusseldorf, carrying 20 passengers who had paid $50 each for their passage. In addition, there were 13 other persons on board. The start was made at 3 o'clock in the morning, and the course laid was up the valley of the Rhine as far as Cologne. Dusseldorf was reached at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the airline distance of 300 miles having been covered in nine hours of actual sailing. From Mannheim to Dusseldorf, favored by the wind, the great ship reached the speed of 50 miles per hour, for this part of the trip, 
outstripping the fastest express trains which consumed six hours in the winding track up the valley. The next morning, the Deutschland left Dusseldorf on an excursion trip, carrying several ladies among its passengers. The voyage was in every way a great success, and public enthusiasm was widespread. On June 29th, a test trip was decided upon. No passengers were taken, but 19 newspaper correspondents were invited guests. The Count had been warned of weather disturbances in the neighborhood, but he either disregarded them or felt confidence in his craft. It was intended that the voyage should last four hours, but the airship soon encountered a storm, and after six hours of futile striving against it, the fuel gave out. Caught in an upward draft, the Deutschland rose to an altitude of over 5,000 feet, losing considerable gas, and then, entering a rainstorm, was heavily laden with moisture. Suddenly, without definite reason, it began to fall vertically, and in a few moments had crashed into the tops of the trees of the Teutoburg forest. No one on board received more than slight injury, and all alighted safely by means of ladders. The Deutschland was a wreck, and was taken apart and shipped back to Friedrichshafen. On July 13th, another giant passenger airship, designed by Oscar Erbslow, who won the international balloon race in 1907 by a voyage from St. Louis to Asbury Park, met with fatal disaster. It was sailing near Cologne, at an altitude of about 2,500 feet, when it burst, and Erbslow and his four companions were killed in the fall. On July 28th, the Gross Three left Berlin with the object of beating the long-distance record for dirigibles. Soon after passing Gotha, the airship returned to that place and abandoned the attempt. In 13 hours, a distance of 260 miles had been traversed. Undismayed by the catastrophes which had destroyed his airships almost as fast as he built them, Count von Zeppelin had his number six ready to sail on September 3. With a crew of seven and twelve passengers, he sailed from Baden to Heidelberg, 53 miles in 65 minutes. It was put into commission as an excursion craft, and made several successful voyages. On September 14th, as it was being placed in its shed at the close of a journey, it took fire unaccountably, and was destroyed together with the shed, a part of the framework only remaining. On October 15th, 1910, the Wellman dirigible America, which had been in preparation for many weeks, left Asbury Park in an attempt to cross the Atlantic. Its balloon was 228 feet long, with a diameter of 52 feet, containing 345,000 cubic feet of gas. The car was 156 feet in length, and was arranged as a tank in which 1,250 gallons of gasoline were carried. A lifeboat was attached underneath the car. There were two engines, each of 80 horsepower, and an auxiliary motor of 10 horsepower. Sleeping quarters were provided for the crew of six, and the balloon was fitted with a wireless telegraph system. All went well until off the island of Nantucket, where strong north winds were encountered, and the dirigible was swept southward toward Bermuda. As an aid in keeping the airship at an elevation of about 200 feet above the sea, an enlarged trail rope, called the equilibrator, had been constructed of cans which were filled with gasoline. This appendage weighed one and a half tons, and the lower part of it was expected to float upon the sea. In practice, it was found that the jarring of this equilibrator, when the sea became rough, disarranged the machinery, so that the propellers would not work, and the balloon was compelled to drift with the wind. Toward evening of the second day, a ship was sighted, and the America's crew were rescued. The airship floated away in the gale, and was soon out of sight. On October 16th, a new Clement Bayard dirigible, with seven men on board, left Paris at 7.15 o'clock in the morning, and sailed for London. At 1 p.m. it circled St. Paul's Cathedral, and landed at the hangar at Wormwood Scrubs a half hour later. At the distance of 259 miles, airline, was traversed at the rate of 41 miles per hour, and the journey surpassed in speed any previous journey by any other form of conveyance. On November 5, 1910, the young Welsh aeronaut Ernest T. Willows, who sailed his small dirigible from Cardiff to London in August, made a trip from London across the English Channel to Douai, France. This is the third time within a month that the Channel had been crossed by airships. Toward the close of 1910, 52 dirigibles were in commission or in process of construction, in the United States there were seven, in Belgium two, in England six, in France twelve, in Germany fourteen, in Italy five, in Russia one, in Spain one. The new Capazza dirigible is a decided departure from all preceding constructions, and may mark a new era in the navigation of the air. Its gas envelope is shaped like a lens, 
or a lentil, and is arranged to sail flatwise with the horizon, thus partaking of the aeroplane as well as the balloon type. No definite facts concerning its achievements have been published. End of chapter 14. Chapter 15 of How It Flies, or Conquest of the Air. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. How It Flies, or Conquest of the Air, by Richard Ferris. Chapter 15. Balloons. How to Operate. The actual operation of a balloon is always entrusted to an experienced pilot, or captain as he is often called, because he is in command, and his authority must be recognized instantly whenever an order is given. Nevertheless, it is often of great importance that every passenger shall understand the details of managing the balloon in case of need, and a well-informed passenger is greatly to be preferred to an ignorant one. It is ordinarily one of the duties of the captain to inspect the balloon thoroughly, to see that there are no holes in the gas bag, that the valve is in perfect working order, and particularly that the valve rope and the ripping cord are not tangled. He should also gather the instruments and equipment to be carried. The instruments are usually an aneroid barometer, and perhaps a mercury barometer, a barograph, a recording barometer, a psychrometer, recording thermometer, a clock, a compass, and an outfit of maps of the country over which it is possible that the balloon may float. Telegraph blanks, railroad timetables, etc., may be found of great service. A camera with a supply of plates will be indispensable, almost, and the camera should be provided with a yellow screen for photographing clouds or distant objects. The ballast should be inspected, to be sure that it is of dry sand, free from stones, or if water is used for ballast, it should have the proper admixture of glycerin to prevent freezing. It is essential that the inflating be properly done and the captain should be competent to direct this process in detail if necessary. What is called the circular method is the simplest, and is entirely satisfactory unless the balloon is being filled with pure hydrogen for a very high ascent, in which case it will doubtless be in the hands of experts. When inflating with coal gas, the supply is usually taken from a large pipe adapted for the purpose. At a convenient distance from the gas main the ground is made smooth, and the ground cloths are spread out and pegged down to keep them in place. The folded balloon is laid out on the cloths with the neck opening toward the gas pipe. The balloon is then unfolded, and so disposed that the valve will be uppermost, and in the center of a circle embracing the upper half of the sphere of the balloon, the opening of the neck projecting a few inches beyond the rim of the circle. The hose from the gas main may then be connected with a socket in the neck. Having made sure that the ripping cord and the valve rope are free from each other, and properly connected with their active parts, and that the valve is fastened in place, the net is laid over the hole and spread out symmetrically. A few bags of ballast are hooked into the net around the circumference of the balloon as it lies, and the assistance distributed around it. It should be the duty of one man to hold the neck of the balloon, and not to leave it for any purpose whatever. The gas may then be turned on, and, as the balloon fills, more bags of ballast are hung symmetrically around the net, and all are continually moved downward as the balloon rises. Constant watching is necessary during the inflation, so that the material of the balloon opens fully without creases, and the net preserves its correct position. When the inflation is finished, the hoop and car are to be hooked in place. The car should be fitted up and hung with an abundance of ballast. Disconnect the gas hose and tie the neck of the balloon in such fashion that it may be opened with a pull of the cord when the ascent begins. The ballast is then transferred to the hoop, or ring, and the balloon allowed to rise until this is clear of the ground. The car is then moved underneath, and the ballast moved down from the ring into it. The trail rope should be made fast to the car directly under the ripping panel, the object being to retard that side of the balloon in landing, so that the gas may escape freely when the panel is torn open, and not underneath the balloon, as would happen if the balloon came to earth with the ripping panel underneath. The balloon is now ready to start and the captain and passengers take their places in the car. The neck of the balloon is opened, and a glance upward will determine if the valve rope hangs freely through it. The lower end of this should be tied to one of the car ropes. The cord to the ripping panel should be tied in a different place, and in such fashion that no mistake can be made between them. The assistants stand around the edge of the basket, holding it so that it shall not rise until the word is given. The captain then adjusts the load of ballast, 
throwing off sufficient to allow the balloon to pull upward lightly against the men who are holding it. A little more ballast is then thrown off, and the word given to let go. The trail rope should be in charge of someone who will see that it lifts freely from the ground. The balloon rises into the air to an altitude where a bulk of the higher and therefore lighter air equal to the bulk of the balloon has exactly the same weight. This is ordinarily about 2,000 feet. If the sun should be shining, the gas in the balloon will be expanded by the heat, and some of it will be forced out through the neck. This explains the importance of the open neck. In some of the early ascensions, no such provision for the expansion of the gas was made, and the balloons burst with disastrous consequences. When some of the gas has been driven out by the heat, there is less weight of gas in the balloon, though it occupies the same space. It, therefore, has a tendency to rise still higher. On the other hand, if it passes into a cloud, or the sun is otherwise obscured, the volume of the gas will contract. It will become denser, and the balloon will descend. To check the descent, the load carried by the balloon must be lightened, and this is accomplished by throwing out some ballast. Generally, a few handfuls is enough. There is always more or less leakage of gas through the envelope as well as from the neck, and this also lessens the lifting power. To restore the balance, more ballast must be thrown out, and in this way an approximate level is kept during the journey. When the ballast is nearly exhausted, it will be necessary to come down, for a comfortable landing cannot be made without the use of ballast. A good landing place having been selected, the valve is opened, and the balloon brought down within a few yards of the ground. The ripping cord is then pulled and ballast thrown out so that the basket will touch as lightly as possible. Some aeronauts use a small anchor or grapnel to assist in making a landing, but on a windy day, when the car is liable to do some bumping before coming to rest, the grapnel often makes matters much worse for the passengers by a series of holdings and slippings, and sometimes causes a destructive strain upon the balloon. In making an ascent with a balloon full of gas, there is certain to be a waste of gas as it expands. This expansion is due not only to the heat of the sun, but also to the lighter pressure of the air in the upper altitudes. It is therefore the custom with some aeronauts to ascend with a partially filled balloon, allowing the expansion to completely fill it. This process is particularly advised if a very high altitude is sought. When it is desired to make a long voyage, it is wise to make the start at twilight, and to so avoid the heat of the sun. The balloon will then float along on an almost unchanging level without expenditure of ballast. Rain and even the moisture from clouds will sometimes wet the balloon so that it will cause a much greater loss of ballast than would have been required to be thrown out to rise above the cloud or storm. Such details in the handling of a balloon during a voyage will demand the skilled judgment of the captain. The trail rope is a valuable adjunct when the balloon is traveling near the ground. The longer the part of the trail rope that is dragging on the ground, the less weight the balloon is carrying. And at night, when it is impossible to tell the direction in which one is traveling in any other way, the line of the trailing rope will show the direction from which the wind is blowing, and hence the drift of the balloon. The care of the balloon and its instruments upon landing falls upon the captain, for he is not likely to find assistance at hand competent to relieve him of any part of the necessary work. The car and the ring are first detached. The ropes are laid out free and clear, and the valve is unscrewed and taken off. The material of the balloon is folded smoothly, gore by gore. The ballast bags are emptied. After all is bundled up, it should be packed in the car, the covering cloth bound on with ropes, and definite instructions affixed for transportation to the starting point. It is apparent that the whole of the gas is lost at the end of the journey. The cost of this is the largest expense of ballooning. For a small balloon of about 50,000 cubic feet, the coal gas for inflating will cost about 35 to $40. If hydrogen is used, it will cost probably ten times as much. In important voyages, it is customary to send up pilot balloons to discover the direction of the wind currents at the different levels, so that the level which promises the best may be selected before the balloon leaves the ground. A study of the weather conditions throughout the surrounding country is a wise precaution, and no start should be made if a storm is imminent. The extent of control possible in ballooning being so limited, all risks should be scrupulously avoided both before and during the voyage, and nothing left to haphazard. End of chapter 15. Chapter 16 of How It Flies, or Conquest of the Air. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
How It Flies or Conquest of the Air by Richard Ferris. Chapter 16. Balloons. How to Make. The making of a balloon is almost always placed in the hands of a professional balloon maker. But as the use of balloons increases, and their owners multiply, it is becoming a matter of importance that the most improved methods of making them should be known to the intending purchaser, as well as to the amateur who wishes to construct his own balloon. The fabric of which the gas envelope is made may be either silk, cotton, percale, or linen. It should be of a tight, diagonal weave, of uniform and strong threads in both warp and woof, unbleached, and without dressing, or finish. If it is colored, care should be exercised that the dye is one that will not affect injuriously the strength or texture of the fabric. Lightness in weight, and great strength, as tested by tearing, are the essentials. The finest German percale weighs about 2.5 ounces per square yard, Russian percale 3 and a third ounces, and French percale 3 and 3 quarter ounces per square yard. The white silk used in Russian military balloons weighs about the same as German percale, but is very much stronger. Pongi silk is a trifle heavier. The silk used for sounding balloons is much lighter, weighing only a little over one ounce to the square yard. Gold beater's skin and rubber have been used to some extent, but the great cost of the former places it in reach only of governmental departments, and the latter is of use only in small balloons for scientific work, up to about 175 cubic feet capacity. The fabric is first to be varnished, to fill up the pores and render it gas tight. For this purpose, a thin linseed oil varnish has been commonly used. To 100 parts of pure linseed oil are added 4 parts of litharge and 1 part of umber, and the mixture is heated to about 350 degrees Fahrenheit for 6 or 7 hours, and stirred constantly. After standing a few days, the clear part is drawn off for use. For the thicker varnish used on later coats, the heat should be raised to 450 degrees and kept at about that temperature until it becomes thick. This operation is attended with much danger of the oil taking fire, and should be done only by an experienced varnish maker. The only advantages of the linseed oil varnish are its ease of application and its cheapness. Its drawbacks are stickiness, requiring continual examination of the balloon envelope, especially when the deflated bag is stored away, its liability to spontaneous combustion, particularly when the varnish is new, and its very slow drying qualities, requiring a long wait between coats. Another varnish made by dissolving rubber in benzene has been largely used. It requires vulcanizing after application. It is never sticky, and it is always soft and pliable. However, the rubber is liable to decomposition from the action of the violet ray of light, and a balloon so varnished requires the protection of an outer yellow covering, either of paint or an additional yellow fabric. Unfortunately, a single sheet of rubberized material is not gas-tight, and it is necessary to make the envelope of two or even three layers of the fabric, thus adding much to the weight. The great gas bags of the Zeppelin airships are varnished with pegamoid, a patent preparation the constituents of which are not known. Its use by Count Zeppelin is the highest recommendation possible. The weight of the varnish adds largely to the weight of the envelope. French Pongi silk, after receiving its five coats of linseed oil varnish, weighs eight ounces per square yard. A double bag of percale with a layer of vulcanized rubber between, and a coating of rubber on the inside, and painted yellow on the outside, will weigh 11 ounces per square yard. Pegamoid material, which comes ready prepared, weighs but about 4 ounces per square yard, but is much more costly. In cutting out the gores of the envelope, it is possible to waste fully a third of the material unless the work is skillfully planned. Taking the width of the chosen material as a basis, we must first deduct from three quarters of an inch to one and a half inches in proportion to the size of the proposed balloon, for a broad seam and the overlapping necessary. Dividing the circumference at the largest diameter, the equator of the balloon, by the remaining width of the fabric gives the number of gores required. To obtain the breadth of each gore at the different latitudes, supposing the globe of the balloon to be divided by parallels similar to those of the earth, the following table is to be used. 0 degrees representing the equator, and 90 degrees the apex of the balloon. The breadth of the gore in inches at any latitude is the product of the decimal opposite that latitude in the table by the original width of the fabric in inches, thus allowing for seams. Finsterwalder's method of cutting material for a spherical balloon, by which over one-fourth of the material, usually wasted in the common method, it may be saved. It has the further advantage of saving more than half of the usual sewing. 
The balloon is considered as a spherical hexahedron, a six-surfaced figure similar to a cube, but with curved sides and edges. The circumference of the sphere divided by the width of the material gives the unit of measurement. The dimensions of the imagined hexahedron may then be determined from the calculated surface, and the cutting proceed according to the illustration above, which shows five breadths to each of the six curved sides. The illustration shows the seams of the balloon made after the Finsterwalder method when looking down upon it from above. In practice, the shape of the gore is calculated by the above table and plotted out on a heavy pasteboard, generally in two sections for convenience in handling. The board is cut to the plotted shape and used as the pattern for every gore. In large establishments, all the gores are cut at once by a machine. The raw edges are hemmed and folded into one another to give a flat seam and are then sewn together through and through in twos and threes. Afterwards, these sections are sewn together. Puckering must be scrupulously avoided. In the case of rubberized material, the thread holes should be smeared with rubber solution, and narrow strips of the fabric cemented over the seams with the same substance. Varnishing is the next process, the gores being treated in turn. Half of the envelope is varnished first, and allowed to dry in a well-ventilated place out of reach of the sun's rays. The other half is varnished when the first is dry. A framework which holds half of the balloon in the shape of a bell is usually employed. In case of haste, the balloon may be blown up with air, but this must be constantly renewed to be of any service. The first step in varnishing is to get one side, the outer or the inner, coated with a varnish thin enough to penetrate the material. Then turn the envelope the other side out and give that a coat of the thin varnish. Next, after all is thoroughly dry, give the outer side a coat of thick varnish, closing all pores. When this is dry, give the inner side a similar coat. Finally, after drying thoroughly, give both sides a coat of olive oil to prevent stickiness. The amount of varnish required is, for the first coat, one and a half times the weight of the envelope, and for the second coat, one half the weight of the thin varnish. For the thick coat on the outer side, one third of the weight of the envelope, and on the inner side, about half as much. For the olive oil coat, about one-eighth of the weight of the envelope will be needed. These figures are approximate, some material requiring more, some less, and a wasteful workman will cause a greater difference. The neck of the balloon, also called the tail, is in form a cylindrical tube of the fabric sewn to an opening in the bottom of the balloon, which has been strengthened by an extra ring of fabric to support it. The lower end of the tube, called the mouth, is sewn to a wooden ring, which stiffens it. The size of the neck is dependent upon the size of the balloon. Its diameter is determined by finding the cube of one-half the diameter of the balloon and dividing it by one thousand. In length, the neck should be at least four times its diameter. The apex of the balloon envelope is fitted with a large valve to permit the escape of gas when it is desired that the balloon shall descend. The door of the valve is made to open inward into the envelope and is pulled open by the valve cord which passes through the neck of the balloon into the basket or car. This valve is called the maneuvering valve, and there are many different designs equally efficient. As they may be had ready-made, it is best for the amateur, unless he is a machinist, to purchase one. The main point to see to is that the seat of the valve is of soft, pliable rubber, and that the door of the valve presses a comparatively sharp edge of metal or wood so firmly upon the seat as to indent it, and the springs of the valve should be strong enough to hold it evenly to its place. The making of the net of the balloon is another part of the work which must be delegated to professionals. The material point is that the net distributes the weight evenly over the surface of the upper hemisphere of the envelope. The strength of the cordage is an item which must be carefully tested. Different samples of the same material show such wide variations in strength that nothing but an actual test will determine. In general, however, it may be said that china grass cordage is four times as strong as hemp cordage and silk cordage is ten times as strong as hemp, for the same size cords. The meshes of the net should be small, allowing the use of a small cord. Large cords mean large knots, and these wear seriously upon the balloon envelope, and are very likely to cause leaks. In large meshes, also, the envelope puffs out between the cords and becomes somewhat stretched, opening pores through which much gas is lost by diffusion. The star, or center of the net at the apex of the balloon, must be fastened immovably to the rim of the valve. The suspension cords begin at from 30 degrees to 45 degrees below the equator of the envelope and are looped through rings in what are called goosenecks. These allow a measure of sliding motion to the cordage as the basket sways in the wind. For protecting the net against rotting from frequent wetting, 
it is recommended to saturate it thoroughly with a solution of acetate of soda, drying immediately. Paraffin is sometimes used with more or less success, but tarring should be avoided, as it materially weakens the cordage. Oil or grease are even worse. At the bottom of the net proper, the few large cords into which the many small cords have been merged are attached to the ring of the balloon. This is either of steel or of several layers of wood well bound together. The ropes supporting the basket are also fastened to this ring, and from it hang the trail rope and the holding ropes. The basket is also to be made by a professional, as upon its workmanship may depend the lives of its occupants, though every other feature of the balloon be faultless. It must be light, and still very strong to carry its load and withstand severe bumping. It should be from three to four feet deep, with a floor space of four feet by five feet. It is usually made of willow and rattan woven substantially together. The ropes supporting the car are passed through the bottom and woven in with it. Buffers are woven on to the outside, and the inside is padded. The seats are small baskets in which is stored the equipment. With the completion of these, the balloon is ready for its furnishings and equipment, which come under the direction of the pilot, or captain, as detailed in the preceding chapter. End of chapter 16、Air. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. How It Flies, or Conquest of the Air, by Richard Ferris. Chapter 17 Military Aeronautics. Almost from the beginning of success in traversing the air, the great possibilities of all forms of aircraft as aids in warfare have been recognized by military authorities, and, as has so often been the case with other inventions by non military minds, the practically unlimited funds at the disposal of national war departments have been available for the development of the balloon at first, then the airship, and now of the aeroplane. The Montgolfiers had scarcely proved the possibility of rising into the air in 1783 before General m u s n i e r was busily engaged in inventing improvements in their balloon with the express purpose of making it of service to his army, and before he was killed in battle he had secured the appointment of a commission to test the improved balloon as to its efficiency in war. The report of the committee being favorable, a balloon corps was formed in April 1794, and the balloon La e n t r e p r e n e u r was used during the Battle of Fleurus. On June 26th, by m u s n i e r s successor, General Jordan, less than a year after m u s n i e r s death. In 1795, this balloon was used in the Battle of Mayence. In both instances, it was employed for observation only. But when the French entered Moscow, they found there and captured a balloon laden with 1,000 pounds of gunpowder, which was intended to have been used against them. In 1796, two other balloons were used by the French army then in front of Andernach and e n n e r e n b r e i t s t e i n and in 1798 the first company of aerosteers was sent to Egypt and operated at the Battle of the Nile and later at Cairo. In the year following, this balloon corps was disbanded. In 1812, Russia secured the services of a German balloon builder named l e p i k or l e p i g to build a war balloon. It had the form of a fish. And was so large that the inflation required five days, but the construction of the framework was faulty, and some important parts gave way during inflation, and the airship never left the ground. As it was intended that this balloon should be dirigible and supplied with explosives, and take an active part in attacks on enemies, it may be regarded as the first aerial warship. In 1849, however, the first actual employment of the balloon in warfare took place. Austria was engaged in the bombardment of Venice. And the range of the besieging batteries was not great enough to permit shells to be dropped into the city. The engineers formed a balloon detachment and made a number of Montgolfiers out of paper. These were of a size sufficient to carry bombs weighing thirty pounds for half an hour before coming down. These war balloons were taken to the windward side of the city, and after a pilot balloon had been floated over the point where the bombs were to fall, and the time consumed in the flight ascertained, the fuses of the bombs were set for the same time, and the war balloons were released. The actual damage done by the dropping of these bombs was not great, but the moral effect upon the people of the city was enormous. The balloon detachment changed its position as the wind changed, and many shells were exploded in the heart of the city, one of them in the marketplace. 
but the destruction wrought was insignificant as compared with that usually resulting from cannonading. As these little mongolfiers were sent up unmanned, perhaps they are not strictly entitled to be dignified by the name of war balloon, being only what in this day would be called aerial bombs. The next use of the balloon in warfare was by Napoleon III in 1859. He sent up Lieutenant Godard, formerly a manufacturer of balloons, and Nadar, the balloonist, at Castiglion. It was a tour of observation only, and Godard made the important discovery that the inhabitants were gathering their flocks of domestic animals and choking the roads with them to oppose the advance of the French. The first military use of balloons in the United States was at the time of the Civil War. Within a month after the war broke out, Professor T. S. C. Lowe of Washington put himself and his balloon at the command of President Lincoln, and on June 18, 1861, he sent to the President a telegram from the balloon, the first record of the kind in history. After the defeat at Manassas, on July 24, 1861, Professor Lowe made a free ascent, and discovered the true position of the Confederates, and proved the falsity of rumors of their advance. The organization of a regular balloon corps followed, and it was attached to McClellan's army, and used in reconnoitering before Yorktown. The balloons were operated under heavy artillery fire, but were not injured. On May 24th, for the first time in history, a general officer, in this case General Stoneman, directed the fire of artillery at a hidden enemy from a balloon. Later in the month balloons were used at Chickahominy, and again at Fair Oaks and Richmond, being towed about by locomotives. On the retreat from before Richmond, McClellan's balloons and gas generators were captured and destroyed. In 1869, during the siege of a fort at Wakamatsu by the Imperial Japanese troops, the besieged sent up a man-carrying kite. After making observations, the officer ascended again with explosives, with which he attempted to disperse the besieging army, but without success. During the siege of Paris, in 1870, there were several experienced balloonists shut up in the city, and the six balloons at hand were quickly repaired and put to use by the army for carrying dispatches and mail beyond the besieging lines. The first trips were made by the professional aeronauts, but as they could not return, there was soon a scarcity of pilots. Sailors and acrobats from the Hippodrome were pressed into the service, and before the siege was raised, sixty-four of these postal balloons had been dispatched. Fifty-seven out of the sixty-four landed safely on French territory and fulfilled their mission. Four were captured by the Germans. One floated to Norway, and one was lost with its crew of two sailors, who faithfully dropped their dispatches on the rocks near the Lizard as they were swept out to sea, and one landed on the islet Hoedic in the Atlantic. In all, one hundred and sixty-four persons left Paris in these balloons, always at night, and there were carried a total of nine tons of dispatches and three million letters. At first dogs were carried to bring back replies, but none ever returned. Then carrier pigeons were used successfully. Replies were set in type and printed. These printed sheets were reduced by photography so that sixteen folio pages of print, containing thirty-two thousand words, were reduced to a space of two inches by one and a quarter inches on the thinnest of gelatine film. Twenty of these films were packed in a quill, and constituted the load for each pigeon. When received in Paris, the films were enlarged by means of a magic lantern, copied, and delivered to the persons addressed. In more recent times, the French used balloons at Tonkin in 1884, the English in Africa in 1885, the Italians in Abyssinia in 1888, and the United States at Santiago in 1898. During the Bear War in 1900, Balloons were used by the British for directing artillery fire, and one was shot to pieces by well-aimed bear cannon. At Port Arthur, both the Japanese and the Russians used balloons and man-carrying kites for observation. The most recent use is that by Spain, in her campaign against the Moors in 1909. The introduction of compressed hydrogen in compact cylinders, which are easily transported, has simplified the problem of inflating balloons in the field, and of restoring gas lost by leakage. The advent of the dirigible has engaged the active attention of the war departments of all the civilized nations, and experiments are constantly progressing, in many instances, in secret. It is a fact at once significant and interesting, as marking the rapidity of the march of improvement, that the German government has lately refused to buy the newest Zeppelin dirigible, on the ground that it is built of aluminum, which is out of date since the discovery of its lighter alloys. 
practically all the armies are being provided with fleets of aeroplanes, ostensibly for use in scouting. But there have been many contests by aviators in bomb dropping which have at least proved that it is possible to drop explosives from an aeroplane with a great degree of accuracy. The favorite target in these contests has been the life-sized outline of a battleship. Glenn Curtis, after his trip down the Hudson from Albany, declared that he could have dropped a large enough torpedo upon the Poughkeepsie Bridge to have wrecked it. His subsequent feats in dropping bombs, represented by oranges, have given weight to his claims. By some writers it is asserted that the successful navigation of the air will guarantee universal peace, that war with aircraft will be so destructive that the whole world will rise against its horrors. Against a fleet of flying machines dropping explosives into the heart of great cities, there can be no adequate defense. On the other hand, Mr. Hudson Maxim declares that the exploding of the limited quantities of dynamite that can be carried on the present types of aeroplanes on the decks of warships would not do any vital damage. He also says that many tons of dynamite might be exploded in Madison Square, New York City, with no more serious results than the blowing out of the windows of the adjacent buildings as the air within rushed out to fill the void caused by the uprush of air heated by the explosion. As yet, the only experience that may be instanced is that of the Russo-Japanese War, where cast-iron shells, weighing 448 pounds, containing 28 pounds of powder, were fired from a high angle into Port Arthur, and did but little damage. In 1899, the Hague Conference passed a resolution prohibiting the use of aircraft to discharge projectiles or explosives, and limited their use in war to observation. Germany, France, and Italy withheld consent upon the proposition. In general, undefended planes are regarded as exempt from attack by bombardment of any kind. Nevertheless, there are straws which show how the wind is blowing. German citizens and clubs which purchase a type of airship approved by the War Office of the German Empire are to receive a substantial subsidy, with the understanding that in case of war the aircraft is to be at the disposal of the government. Under this plan, it is expected that the German government will control a large fleet of ships of the air without being obliged to own them. And, in France, funds were raised recently, by popular subscription, sufficient to provide the nation with a fleet of 14 airships, dirigibles, and 30 aeroplanes. These are already being built, and it will not be long before France will have the largest air fleet afloat. The results of the German maneuvers with a fleet of four dirigibles in a night attack upon strong fortresses have been kept a profound secret, as if of great value to the war office. In the United States, the Signal Corps has been active in operating the Baldwin dirigible and the Wright aeroplanes owned by the government. To the latter, wireless telegraphic apparatus has been attached and is operated successfully when the machines are in flight. In addition, the United States Aeronautical Reserve has been formed, with a large membership of prominent amateur and professional aviators. Some military experts, however, assert that the dirigible is hopelessly outclassed for warfare by the aeroplane, which can operate in winds in which the dirigible dare not venture, and can soar so high above any altitude that the dirigible can reach as to easily destroy it. Another argument used against the availability of the dirigible as a war vessel is that if it were launched on a wind which carried it over the enemy's country, it might not be able to return at sufficient speed to escape destruction by high-firing guns, even if its limited fuel capacity did not force a landing. Even the observation value of the aircraft is in some dispute. As a matter of fact, the moisture ordinarily in the air effectually limits the range of both natural vision and the use of the camera for photographing objects on the ground. The usual limit of practical range of the best telescope is 8 miles. All things considered, however, it is to be expected that the experimenting by Army and Navy officers all over the world will lead to such improvement and invention in the art of navigating the air as will develop its benevolent rather than its malevolent possibilities, a consummation devoutly to be wished. End of chapter 17《Of How It Flies》or《Conquest of the Air》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《How It Flies》or《Conquest of the Air》by Richard Ferris Chapter 18 Biographies of Prominent Aeronauts on January the 1st, 1909, 
it would have been a brief task to write a few biographical notes about the prominent aviators at that date there were but five who had made flights exceeding ten minutes in duration the wright brothers farman de la grange and blériot at the close of nineteen ten the role of aviators who have distinguished themselves by winning prizes or breaking previous records has increased to more than one hundred and the number of qualified pilots of flying machines now numbers over three hundred the impossibility of of giving even a mention of the notable airmen in this chapter is apparent and the few whose names have been selected are those who have more recently in our own country come into larger public notice and those of the pioneers whose names will never lose their first prominence the wright brothers the wright brothers have so systematically linked their individual personalities in all their work in private no less than in public that the brief life story to be told here is but one for them both in fact until wilbur went to france in nineteen o eight and orville to washington the nearest approach to a separation is illustrated by a historic remark of wilbur's to an acquaintance in dayton one afternoon orville flew twenty-one miles yesterday i am going to beat that to-day and he did by three miles their early life in their home town of Dayton, Ohio, was unmarked by significant incident. They were interested in bicycles, and at length went into the business of repairing and selling these machines. Their attention seems to have been strongly turned to the subject of human flight by the death of Lilienthal in August 1896, at which time the press published some of the results of his experiments. A magazine article by Octave Chanute, himself an experimenter with gliders, led to correspondence with him, and the Wrights began a series of similar investigations with models of their own building. By 1900, they had succeeded in flying a large glider by running with a string, as with a kite, and in the following year they had made some flights on their gliders, of which they had several of differing types. For two years the Wrights studied and tested and disproved nearly every formula laid down by scientific works for the relations of gravity to air, and finally gave themselves up to discovering by actual trial what the true conditions were, and to the improvement of their gliders accordingly. Meanwhile they continued their constant personal practice in the air. The most of this experimental work was done at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina for the reason that there the winds blow more uniformly than at any other place in the United States, and the great sand dunes there gave the Wrights the needed elevation from which to leap into the wind with their gliders. Consequently, when at last they were ready to try a machine driven by a motor, it was at this secluded spot that the first flights ever made by man with a heavier-than-air machine took place. On December the 17th, 1903, their first machine left the ground under its own power and remained in the air for twelve seconds from this time on progress was even slower than before on account of the complications added by the motive power but by the time another year had passed they were making flights which lasted five minutes and had their machine in such control that they could fly in a circle and make a safe landing within a few feet of the spot designated on the 5th of October, 1905, Wilbur Wright made his historic flight of 24 miles at Dayton, Ohio, beating the record of Orville made the day before of 21 miles. The average speed of these flights was 38 miles an hour. No contention as to the priority of the device known as wing warping can ever set aside the fact that these long practical flights were made more than a year before any other man had flown five hundred feet or had remained in the air half a minute with a heavier than air machine driven by power the wrights are now at the head of one of the large airplane manufacturers of the world and devote the larger part of their time to research work in the line of the navigation of the air alberto santos dumont Alberto Santos Dumont was born in Brazil in 1877, 
but when a lad he became intensely interested in aeronautics having been aroused by witnessing the ascension at a show of an ordinary hot air balloon within the next few years he had made several trips to paris and in eighteen ninety seven made his first ascent in a balloon with the balloon builder machuron the partner of the famous la chambre in eighteen ninety eight he began the construction of his notable series of dirigibles which eventually reached twelve in number with his number six he won the twenty thousand dollar prize offered by m deutsch de la meurthe for the first trip from the paris aero club's grounds to and around the eiffel tower in thirty minutes or less the distance was nearly seven miles it is characteristic of m santos dumont that he should give fifteen thousand dollars of the prize to relieve distress among the poor of paris and the remainder to his mechanicians who had built the balloon his smallest dirigible was the number nine which held seven thousand seven hundred and seventy cubic feet of gas the largest was the number ten which held eighty thousand cubic feet in nineteen o five when bleriot voisin and their comrades were striving to accomplish flight with machines heavier than air santos dumont turned his genius upon the same problem and on august the fourteenth nineteen o six he made his first flight with a cellular biplane driven by a twenty four horsepower motor on november the thirteenth of the same year he flew seven hundred and twenty feet with the same machine these were the first flights of heavier-than-air machines in Europe, and the first public flights anywhere. Later he turned to the monoplane type, and with La Demoiselle added new laurels to those already won with his dirigibles. Louis Blériot Louis Blériot, designer and builder of the celebrated Blériot monoplanes, and himself a pilot of the first rank, was born in Cambrai, France, in 1872. He graduated from a noted technical school and soon attached himself to the group of young men all under thirty years of age who were experimenting with gliders in the effort to fly his attempts at first were with the flapping wing contrivances but he soon gave these up as a failure and devoted his energy to the automobile industry and the excellent blerio acetylene headlight testifies to his constructive ability in that field attracted by the experiments of m ernest archdeacon he joined his following and with gabriel voisin engaged in building gliders of the biplane type by nineteen o seven he had turned wholly to the monoplane idea and in april of that year made his first leap into the air with a power-driven monoplane by september he had so improved his machine that he was able to fly six hundred feet and in june nineteen o eight he broke the record for monoplanes by flying nearly a mile again and again he beat his own records and at length the whole civilized world was thrilled by his triumphant flight across the british channel on july the twenty fifth nineteen o nine the blerio machines hold nearly all the speed records and many of those in other lines of achievement and monsieur blerio enjoys the double honour of being an eminently successful manufacturer as well as a dauntless aviator of heroic rank gabriel voisin gabriel voisin the elder of the two voisin brothers was born in eighteen seventy nine at belleville sur saone near the city of lyon france he was educated as an architect but early became interested in aeronautics and engaged in gliding stimulated by the achievements of pilcher in england and captain ferber in his own country he assisted m archdeacon in his experiments on the seine often riding the gliders which were towed by the swift motor-boats in nineteen o six he associated himself with his brother in the business of manufacturing biplanes and in march nineteen o seven he himself made the first long flight with a power-driven machine in europe this aeroplane was built for his friend de la grange and was one in which the latter was soon breaking records and winning prizes the second machine was for farman who made the voisin biplane famous by winning the deutsch archdeacon prize of ten thousand pounds for making a flight of one thousand and ninety three yards in a circle 
The Voisin biplane is distinctive in structure, and is accounted one of the leading aeroplanes of the present day. Léon de la Grange Léon de la Grange was born at Orléans, France, in 1873. He entered the School of Arts as a student in sculpture about the same time that Henri Farman went there to study painting, and Gabriel Voisin, architecture. He exhibited at the Salon and won several medals. In 1905, he took up aeronautics, assisted at the experiments of Monsieur Archdeacon. His first aeroplane was built by Voisin, and he made his first flight at Issy, March 14, 1907. Less than a month later, on April the 11th, he made a new record for duration of flight, remaining in the air for 9 minutes and 15 seconds, twice as long as the previous record made by Farman. At Reims in 1909, he appeared with a Blériot monoplane and continued to fly with that type of machine until his death. At Doncaster, England, he made the world record for speed up to that time, travelling at the rate of 49.9 miles per hour. He was killed at Bordeaux, France, in January 1910, by the fall of his machine. Henri Farmer Henri Farmer, justly regarded as the most prominent figure in the aviation world today, was born in France in 1873. His father was an Englishman. While a mere boy, he became locally famous as a bicycle racer, and later achieved a wider fame as a fearless and skilful driver in automobile races. In 1902, he won the Paris-Vienna race. In September 1907, he made his first attempt to fly, using the second biplane built by his friend Gabriel Voisin, and in the following year, he won with it the Deutsch Archdeacon Prize of $10,000. He then built a machine after his own ideas, which more resembles the Wright machine than the Voisin, and with it he has won many prizes and made many world records. Demands for machines and for teaching the art of handling them have poured in upon him, necessitating a continual increase of manufacturing facilities until it may safely be said that he has the largest plant for building flying machines in the world turning out the largest number of machines and through his school for aviators is instructing a larger number of pupils annually than any other similar establishment robert esno pelterry robert esno pelterry was born in eighteen eighty and educated in the city of paris he early showed a mechanical turn of mind and was interested particularly in scientific studies he became an enthusiast in matters aeronautic and devoted himself to the construction of gasoline engines suitable for aviation purposes. After satisfying his ideal in this direction with the now famous REP motor, he designed a new type of flying machine which is known as the REP monoplane. His first flights were made at Bouc in October 1907, and while they were short, they proved the possibility of steering a flying machine so that it would describe a curved line, at that time a considerable achievement, among European aviators. In April 1908, he flew for three quarters of a mile and reached a height of 100 feet. This feat eclipsed all previous records for monoplanes. His fame, however, rests upon his motors, which are quite original in design and construction. Count Ferdinand von Zeppelin Count Ferdinand von Zeppelin was born in 1838 on the shores of Lake Constance, where his great airships have had their initial trials. It is an interesting fact that Count von Zeppelin made his first balloon ascension in a war balloon attached to the Army Corps commanded by his friend Karl Schurz during the Civil War. It was only after years of absorbing study of all that human knowledge could contribute that count von zeppelin decided upon the type of dirigible which bears his name under the patronage of the king of württemberg he began his first airship having previously built an immense floating shed which swinging by a cable always had its doors facing away from the wind 
the successful flights of the series of magnificent zeppelin airships have been marvellous in an age crowded with wonders and the misfortune which has followed close upon their superb achievements with complete destruction would long ago have undone a man of less energy and courage than the dauntless count it should be borne in mind however that of the hundreds of passengers carried in his ships of the air all have come to land safely a record that it would be difficult to match with any other form of travel the accidents which have destroyed the zeppelins have never happened in the air excepting only the wrecking of the deutschland by a thunderstorm the indefatigable count is now constructing another airship with the new alloy electron instead of aluminum he estimates that five thousand pounds weight can be saved in this way captain thomas s baldwin captain thomas s baldwin balloonist and aviator was born in mississippi in eighteen fifty five his first aeronautical experience was as a parachute rider from a balloon in the air he invented the parachute he used and received for it a gold medal from the balloon society of great britain exhibiting this parachute captain baldwin made an extensive tour of the civilized world in eighteen ninety two he built his first airship a combination of a balloon a screw propeller and a bicycle the last to finish the motive power it was not until nineteen o two when he installed an automobile engine in his airship that he succeeded in making it sail it was not yet dirigible however but after two years of devising and experimenting he sailed away from oakland california on august the second nineteen o four against the wind and after a short voyage turned and came back to his balloon shed from this time on he made several successful dirigibles and in nineteen o eight he met all the requirements of the united states government for a military dirigible and sold to it the only dirigible it possesses he became interested in the experiments of curtis and mccurdy at hammondsport in nineteen o eight and aided in building the remarkable series of biplanes with which record flights were made the newer design known as the baldwin biplane is unique in the pivoted balancing plane set upright above the upper plane a device entirely distinct from the warping or other manipulation of horizontal surfaces for the purpose of restoring lateral balance glen hammond curtis glen hammond curtis was born at hammondsport new york on the shore of lake kuka in eighteen seventy eight from boyhood he was a competitor and winner in all sorts of races where speed was the supreme test by nature a mechanic he became noted for his ingenious contrivances in this line and built a series of extremely fast motorcycles with one of which he made the record of one mile in twenty six and two fifths seconds which still stands as the fastest mile ever made by man with any form of mechanism through the purchasing of one of his light engines by captain baldwin for his dirigible curtis became interested in aeronautical matters and soon built a glider with which he sailed down from the hammondsport hills the combination of his motor and the glider was the next step and on july the fourth nineteen o eight he flew one and a half miles with the june bug winning the scientific american trophy learning that the united states was not to be represented at the reims meet in august nineteen o nine he hastily built a biplane and went there he won the first prize for the course of thirty kilometres eighteen point six miles second prize for the course of ten kilometres the james gordon bennett cup and the tenth prize in the contest for distance from reims he went to brescia italy and there won the first prize for speed in all these contests he was matching his biplane against monoplanes which were acknowledged to be a faster type than the biplane on may the twenty ninth nineteen ten mr curtis made the first stated aeroplane tour to take place in this country travelling from albany to new york city one hundred and thirty seven miles with but one stop for fuel with this flight he won a prize of ten thousand dollars he has made many other notable flights and stands in the foremost rank of the active aviators 
At the same time, he is busily engaged in the manufacture of the Curtis biplane and the Curtis engine, both staple productions in their line. Charles Keeney Hamilton Charles Keeney Hamilton is justly regarded as one of the most skilful of aviators. He was born in Connecticut in 1881 and showed his bent by making distressing and often disastrous leaps from high places with the family umbrella for a parachute. In 1904, he worked with Mr. Israel Ludlow, who at that time was experimenting with gliders of his own construction, and when Mr. Ludlow began towing them behind automobiles, Hamilton rode on the gliders and steered them. Later, he became interested in ballooning and made a tour of Japan with a small dirigible. He early became famous in the aviation world by his spectacular glides from a great height. He has said that the first of these was unintentional, but his motor having stopped suddenly while he was high in the air, he had only the other alternative of falling vertically. The sensation of the swift gliding having pleased him, he does it frequently for the fun of it. These glides are made at so steep an angle that they have gained the distinctive name Hamilton Dives. Hamilton came most prominently before the public at large with his flight from Governor's Island to Philadelphia and back on June the 13th, 1910. Following close upon Curtis's flight from Albany to New York, it was not only a record-breaking achievement, but helped to establish in this country the value of the aeroplane as a vehicle for place-to-place -place journeyings. Hubert Latham Hubert Latham, the famous Antoinette pilot, is a graduate of Oxford. His father was a naturalised Frenchman. His first aeronautical experience was as companion to his cousin, Jacques Faure, the balloonist, on his famous trip from London to Paris in six and a half hours, the fastest time ever made between the two places until the Clermont Bayard dirigible surpassed it by a few minutes on October the 16th, 1910. The Antoinette monoplane, with which Monsieur Latham is identified himself, began with the ingenious engine of Le Vavasseur, which was speedily made use of for aeroplanes by Santos Dumont, Blériot, and Farman. Le Vavasseur also had ideas about aeroplanes and persuaded some capitalists to back him in the enterprise. When it was done, no one could be found to fly it. Here, Monsieur Latham, a lieutenant of miners and sappers in the French army, stepped into the breach and has made a name for himself and for the Antoinette machine in the forefront of the progress of aviation. After winning several contests, he set out on July the 19th, 1909, to cross the British Channel. After flying about half the distance, he fell into the sea. Six days later, Blériot made the crossing successfully, and Latham made a second attempt on July the 27th, and this time got within a mile of the Dover coast before he again came down in the water. He has shown unsurpassed daring and skill in flying in gales blowing at 40 miles per hour, a record which few other aviators had cared to rival. Alfred Leblanc Alfred Leblanc, the champion cross-country flyer of the world, was born in France in 1879. By profession, he is a metallurgist. A friend of Blériot, he became interested in monoplane flying, the more readily because he was already a skilled balloonist. At the time Blériot made his historic flight across the British Channel, Leblanc preceded him, and, standing on the Dover shore, signalled Blériot where to strike the land. He organised Blériot's school for aviators at Pau, and became its director. Its excellence is exhibited in the quality of its pupils, among them Chavez, Moran, and Aubrun. The achievement through which Leblanc is most widely known is his winning of the 489-mile race over the northern part of France in August 1910, and with the victory, the prize of $20,000 offered. Claude Graham White Claude Graham White, the most famous of British aviators, learned to fly in France under the tutelage of Monsieur Blériot. Having accomplished so much, he went to Montmelon, the location of Farman's establishment, and made himself equally proficient on the Farman biplane. While in France, he taught many pupils, among them Armstrong Drexel. 
returning to england he opened a school for english aviators he came into prominent public notice in his contest with paulin in the race from london to manchester and although paulin won the prize graham white received a full share of glory for his plucky persistence against discouraging mishaps at the boston harvard meet in september nineteen ten graham white carried off nearly all the prizes and in addition won for himself a large measure of personal popularity on october the fourteenth he flew from the benning race track six miles away over the potomac river round the dome of the capitol the washington monument and over the course of pennsylvania avenue up to the state war and navy department building alighting accurately with his forty-foot biplane in the sixty-foot street having ended his call he mounted his machine and rose skilfully into the air and returned to his starting point at the belmont park meet in october graham white captured the international speed prize with his one hundred horsepower Blériot monoplane and finished second in the race around the statue of liberty being beaten by only forty-three seconds louis paulin louis paulin was in january nineteen o nine a mechanic at montmelon france earning the good wages in that country of fifteen dollars per week he became an aviator making his first flight on july the tenth nineteen o nine of one and a quarter miles five days later he flew over forty miles remaining in the air one hour seventeen minutes and rising to an altitude of three hundred and fifty seven feet then the world's record he flew constantly in public through the remainder of nineteen o nine winning many prizes and breaking and making records in january nineteen ten he was the most prominent aviator at the los angeles meet and there made a new world's record for altitude four thousand one hundred and sixty six feet within the thirteen months and three weeks up to october the first nineteen ten that he has been flying he has won over one hundred thousand dollars in prizes besides receiving many handsome fees for other flights and for instruction to pupils clifford b harmon clifford b harmon has the double distinction of being not only the foremost amateur aviator of america but his feats have also at times excelled those of the professional airmen on july the second nineteen ten mr harmon made a continuous flight of more than two hours breaking all american records and this he held for several months mr harmon's first experience in the air was as a balloonist and in this capacity he held the duration record of forty-eight hours twenty-six minutes for a year on this same voyage at the st louis centennial he made a new record in america for altitude attained twenty four thousand four hundred feet at the los angeles aviation meet in january nineteen ten where he went with his balloon new york he met paulin and became his pupil at that meet paulin made a new world's record for altitude with a farman biplane and this machine mr harmon bought and bought to mineola long island where he practised assiduously crowning his minor achievements by flying from there across long island sound to greenwich connecticut at the boston harvard aviation meet in september nineteen ten mr harmon won every prize offered to amateur contestants walter brookins walter brookins is one of the youngest of noted aviators he was born in dayton ohio in eighteen ninety and went to school to miss catherine wright sister of the wright brothers young walter was greatly interested in the experiments made by the wrights and orville one day promised him that when he grew up they would build a flying machine for him brookins appeared at dayton in the early part of nineteen ten after several years absence during which he had grown up and demanded the promised flying machine the wrights met the demand and developed brookins into one of the most successful american aviators brookins's first leap into prominence was at the indianapolis meet in june nineteen ten where he made a new world's record for altitude four thousand eight hundred and three feet this being beaten soon after in europe by j armstrong drexel with six thousand six hundred feet brookins attempted 
at Atlantic City in September to excel Drexel's record and rose to a height of 6,175 feet, being forced to come down by the missing of his motor. On September 29, 1910, he left Chicago for Springfield, Illinois. He made two stops on the way for repairs and fuel, and reached Springfield in seven hours, nine minutes elapsed time. His actual time in the air was five hours, 47 minutes. The airline distance between the two cities is 187 miles, but as Brookings flew in the face of a wind blowing 10 miles an hour, he actually travelled 250 miles. During the journey, Brookings made a new cross-country record for America in a continuous flight for 2 hours 38 minutes. John B. Moissant John B. Moissant is an architect of Chicago, born there of Spanish parentage in 1883. Becoming interested in aviation, he went to France in 1909 and began the construction of two aeroplanes, one of them entirely of metal. He started to learn to fly on a Blériot machine and one day took one of his mechanicians aboard and started for London. The mechanician had never before been up in an aeroplane. After battling with storms and repairing consequent accidents to his machine, Moissant landed his passenger in London three weeks after the start. It was the first trip between the two cities for an aeroplane carrying a passenger, and although Moissant failed to win the prize which had been offered for such a feat, he received a great ovation, and a special medal was struck for him. At the Belmont Park meet in October 1910, Moissant, after wrecking his own machine in a gale, climbed into Leblanc's Blériot, which had been secured for him but a few minutes before, and made the trip around the Statue of Liberty in New York Bay, and returned to the park in 34 minutes 38 seconds. As the distance is over 34 miles, the speed was nearly a mile a minute. This feat won for him, and for America, the grand prize of the meet, $10,000. J. Armstrong Drexel J. Armstrong Drexel is a native of Philadelphia. He was taught to fly a Blériot machine at Pau by Graham White, and he has frequently surpassed his instructor in contests where both took part. At the English meets in 1910, he won many of the prizes, being excelled in this respect only by Leon Moran. At Lanark, Scotland, he established a new world's record for altitude, 6,600 feet. At the Belmont Park meet, he passed his former record with an altitude of 7,185 feet, making this the American record, though it had been excelled in Europe. At Philadelphia, November the 23rd, 1910, he reached an altitude of 9,970 feet, according to the recording barometer he carried, thus making a new world's record. This record was disputed by the Aero Club, and it may be reduced. A millionaire, he flies for the sheer love of the sport. Ralph Johnston Ralph Johnston was born in Kansas City, Missouri in 1880. He became an expert bicycle rider and travelled extensively in many countries giving exhibitions of trick bicycle riding, including the feat known as Looping the Loop. He joined the staff of the Wright Brothers Aviators in April 1910 and speedily became one of the most skilful aeroplane operators. He made a speciality of altitude flying, breaking his former records day after day and finally, at the International Aviation Meet at Belmont Park, Long Island, in October 1910, he made a new world's altitude record of 9,714 feet, surpassing the previous record of 9,121 feet made by Wynne Marlin at Mormelon on October the 1st. Johnston was instantly killed at Denver, Colorado on November the 14th, 1910 by a fall with his machine owing to the breaking of one of the wings at a height of 800 feet. End of chapter 18